credit. So our next presenter is Habib Doman. Habib came to me last year with his own research idea, which is fantastic. He was highly motivated and just ready to get going from the start to start working on this. Um, so he has pretty much come up with this mostly all by himself. My role in this was really just to bounce ideas off of and make sure he didn't blow anything up in my lab. Uh, the rest was really all of you. So. Uh, hello everybody, my name is Aviv Zoman, and for these past couple semesters I've been working with Dr. Jerry LaRue in designing and building a microwave plasma reactor for graphene synthesis. So this title raises about four questions. What's graphene? What's a microwave plasma reactor? What's their connection? And, you know, who cares? So I hope throughout this presentation I'll be answering those questions. So. I'll first start off by describing what graphene is. And in doing that, it's helpful to talk about graphite, the form of carbon that we're all familiar with uh, that's commonly known as pencil lead. The molecular structure of graphite resembles a deck of cards, um, where each card in this deck is a sheet of carbon atoms arranged in a honeycomb lattice. And if you remove one of these cards from the graphite deck, then you get graphene. So in other words, graphene is just a single layer of graphite. So the natural next question is, so what? I mean, you know, who cares about what graphene is? Well, it's graphene's extreme thinness. It's only one atom layer thin, one atom thin, um, and molecular structure that give rise to a unique combination of incredible properties. Um, for example, it's, it's 200 times stronger than steel. It's the strongest material ever measured, yet it's also the thinnest. Um, it's more electrically conductive than copper, more thermally conductive than diamond, um, it's optically transparent, yet so dense that it's impermeable to all gases. And on top of all of that, it's more elastic than rubber. Um, and no one material has ever encompassed all of these properties before, so graphene has been coined as our era's ultimate material. So graphene will revolutionize every industry imaginable and certainly create new ones. Uh, we'll get lighter, stronger structures uh, in the field of architecture, Lighter, safer, stronger vehicles in the automobile and aeronautical industry, and we'll see you know the electronics sector revolutionized by transparent bendable electronics, and we'll see uh, energy harvesting devices like solar cells and batteries taken to the next level. But we aren't yet reaping the benefits of graphene because it's so hard to produce. Most processes today produce graphene that's impure, flaky. Uh, wrinkled, cracked, and multi-layered, and all of these diminish graphene's properties. Um, it's only after determining a method that will produce, uh, that will consistently produce pure, single-layer graphene that will really be propelled into this graphene age. And this is the aim of my research. So, microwave plasma chemical vapor deposition is a promising method to solve this graphene production issue. Uh, this title is formidable, so I'll break it down one at a time. A deposition is just a phase transition, when a vapor transitions to a solid. Chemical vapor is a chemical that readily vaporizes, and chemical implies that it's from the gas phase, not solid or liquid phase. A plasma is the fourth state of matter, and in describing a plasma, it's helpful to talk about the previous three states. So, in a solid, the particles are closely packed together, in a liquid, a little further apart, in a gas, they're free-flowing, take in the volumes or in a plasma, the energy of the system is so high that these particles are actually stripped of their electrons, and we are left with these negatively charged electrons and positively charged ions that are continuously colliding into each other, creating even more charged particles. And so in essence, a plasma is a soup of charged particles, free radicals, excited state molecules, and most notably photons, which give plasma its characteristic glow. An example of plasma that we all know is lightning. In this case, it's the air molecule being ionized. A microwave plasma just means that this plasma is being ignited by microwave radiation. It's specifically 2.45 gigahertz here because that just so happens to be the frequency of microwave radiation in every household microwave oven. Uh, and microwave plasma is essential to this process because it's the source of activation energy for compound formation at the substrate. So to bring it full circle, microwave plasma chemical vapor deposition utilizes microwaves to generate a plasma which then deposits its contents onto a desired substrate. It's a method to produce materials from the bottom up. 
A microwave plasma reactor is the module in which microwave plasma chemical vapor deposition occurs in. And it's this very system that I spent the past few months designing and building with Dr. Rue um, to form graphene. So I'll first walk through its components and then the actual system afterwards. So first, the vacuum pump. This is to get rid of any contaminants in the system because we want a pure graphene sample. Additionally, this low pressure environment actually allows the microwave radiation to ionize and dissociate the molecules. And this is why you don't generate a plasma every time you turn on your microwave at home. Microwave radiation is simply too weak to affect all of those particles in ambient conditions. Uh, next are the gases. Argon isn't used during deposition, but prior. It's, it's used to clean out the system of any contaminants and therefore decreases the system pressure significantly. Next is methane. Methane is the primary feed gas. That is, it's the gas that supplies the carbon for graphene formation. It has a low dissociation bond energy, which is advantageous for forming these reactive uh, carbon species as shown in this last line here, uh, which enable the graphene growth. Hydrogen also plays a critical role at the actual substrate, where it also catalyzes carbon activation. Uh, in this case, it works by dehydrogenation of methane, as shown in this first reaction. And it's only once we have this reactive carbon species uh, that we get graphene, as illustrated in the second reaction. And both uh, methane and hydrogen are fed into the system by flow meters because their ratio is critical to pure graphene production. So next is nickel sheet. This is our substrate. This is where the graphene actually forms. Nickel is chosen because it has a high carbon solubility, which enhances graphene growth, as well as promotes crystallinity of the graphene film. So if we take a closer look, we see that those reactive carbon species that I mentioned earlier are bonding with this nickel surface um, and forming graphene. And then next, this whole reaction takes place in a vacuum chamber that ought to be made of quartz because quartz is strong and can withstand uh, high temperature swings, which is necessary to withstand a plasma for a long time. Additionally, it allows microwaves to pass through it. And lastly, everything is enclosed in a household microwave oven um, because these are inexpensive, easily obtainable, and provide the microwave radiation necessary to ignite a plasma. So enough of the abstraction, here are some concrete images of the system. Um, here is the, uh, that vacuum pump that I mentioned, and this giant exhaust line is the exhaust line that feeds into the building's exhaust system, just getting rid of any byproducts of the, of the reaction we don't want. And then this guy, there's a lot going on in these pictures, but this guy here is the vacuum display, which <coughs> surprisingly displays the pressure of the, the vacuum chamber, which is important to know. And that connects to this vacuum gauge, which is in line here um, to this vacuum inlet. And that vacuum inlet channels into the, this aluminum block here, which is the base of the deposition chamber. It has two tunnels, one for this vacuum inlet here, and then the other for the gases that enter through this shower head uh, orientation. And the reason it's a, it's a shower head is because we want the molecules accelerating directly down into the substrate, which would lie about here. This is a Viton rubber gasket, which interfaces this aluminum block, and what should be a quartz container. This one's been replaced. And then here is that this gas line, and how gas is entered through this system is by the following configuration. As you can see, there are at least a couple valves between every gas, uh, in their, between their tank and entering the system. This is a, safety precaution, you have to really want the gas to be in there, you have to know what you're doing. And additionally, it, it uh, avoids compromising the vacuum. And then, as you can see, the hydrogen isn't actually connected to anything yet. That's because I've only just finished setting up this system and I'm taking it one gas at a time still. <laughs> and then here's how the methane tank, which is flowed through this, or fed into the system by this flow meter, um, which I've balanced by Jared rigging on this platform. And then lastly, here's this argon tank, uh, which actually has two inputs to the system. One, if you follow this line, actually populates the entire microwave oven with argon because in the low probability event that methane seeps out of the chamber, we don't want it reacting with oxygen at high temperatures. And here's that uh, argon line that flows directly into the system as we've seen previously.
And so to put an even better face to a name, I thought it would be fun to actually watch um, a deposition process to see what it looks like. I'll leave it unnarrated, so feast your eyes. deposition, uh, I characterize these, these results using a scanning electron microscope. Um, and so what we can see here is a comparison between the bare nickel substrate, just what a you know, nickel substrate looks like under this microscope, and a couple of deposition samples. They're virtually identical because the production parameters are still young, um, so this is unsurprising. Additionally, this leads me into the future directions of this project. I first would like to use Raman spectroscopy to characterize the results because Raman is the ideal graphene analysis tool. It really tells you how many layers your sample is and how impure it is. Uh, another future direction is using induction heating to increase plasma density. And by plasma density, I mean the quantity of these reactive, reactive carbon species for graphene formation. So how this would work is I'd wrap the, the chamber in a copper coil send an alternating current through it, and what this alternating current uh, would do is it produces an alternating magnetic field which would induce a voltage in the plasma, which I hypothesize will increase the energy of these, of these electrons and charged particles in there, creating more successful collisions, which is important for graphene growth. And this isn't, you know, theoretical. I've actually already set this up. It's just a matter of carrying out. Here is that copper coil wrapped around the chamber, and it's connected to a water cooling system here uh, that's, that leads into this bucket of water with a water pump, and then here's the electrical circuitry that provides the alternating current to it. Additionally, I like to confine the plasma with magnetism. Uh, see, plasma has a really interesting dynamic with, with magnetism, uh, as illustrating this first picture, uh, where the the magnetic field line spiralizes the electrons and ions. So taking advantage of this behavior, I'd like to wrap the chamber in permanent magnets that are alternating in magnetic orientation so that their field lines feed into one another. And then you can imagine that these charged particles are spiralizing in a, in a localized area. And this is to for, like, keep the system, uh, the heat of the system in a specific area because I don't want the substrate getting so hot. And this leads me to my next point. I'd, I'd like to install a thermal couple in, in the chamber to measure the uh, reaction chamber because the ultimate aim is to deposit graphene on insulating substrates like plastic and glass, which would melt at uh, high temperatures. And then lastly, um, I'd like to use machine learning techniques to determine the optimal production parameters for graphene growth. And this is pretty straightforward after you know, I set up Raman spectroscopy and run a few trials and have enough data to do this. Uh, and while I'm very happy with the current state of this project and look forward to the forthcoming work, um, I owe a lot to the Center of Undergraduate Excellence for helping me kickstart this project, uh, my UP Weldon and Matthew Schneider at Ballard's Makerspace for helping me machine parts, my dad, Gary Zoman, for helping me machine parts, uh, inspiration to take on this project from Jeremy Schultz and Robert Ray Smith, uh, Dr. Islam for helping me characterize these results in such short notice, and Dean Lyon for referring me to Dr. LaRue, who I owe a very special thanks to for allowing me to establish this independent project in his lab, despite its unrelatedness completely to his research agenda, and then giving me the freedom to pursue it limitlessly, except for safety, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I'd like to thank you all very much for your attention. So it creates a sort of self-limiting nature of the graphene growth. Um, 
but I don't really want to extrapolate any further because I don't want to provide a hand wavy explanation. Other questions? I'd imagine that uniformity is very important. Um, this is why I've, I'm, I'll just bring it back up. This is why I plan on using induction heating, uh, you know, to increase that sort of uniformity, I guess, the energy of the, the system. Um, additionally, I'm, I'm using a microwave oven because it's just convenient. It cost me $20 on offer up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it yeah, can't be that. Um, I have investigated actually rewiring the microwave uh, mm -hmm. like using a transformer, but that would, you know, I wouldn't uh, risk messing with the equal components like that. So um, this is a good technique. But yes, uniformity in terms of the, the reaction of the, right. is certainly important. Yeah. Uh, what, what are some cases and processes that you think can make their, you know, slow the lab? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Right, so um, the, the very first safety precaution is, you know, having a very, uh, very tight vacuum. So this gets down to, you know, about 100 millitor, and you, you know, we live in 760 tor region. So, um, so that means that the, the container itself can't just accidentally fall over, you know, when there's methane inside of it. Like it's really stuck in place by the vacuum created. Additionally, uh, we use argon to we flood the entire microwave oven with argon in the case that methane would seep out and react with oxygen and at high temperatures to prevent that. Um, so the, the methane would just seep out and bounce into argon molecules. So that's a preventative measure. If, you, if you'd like to you know, offer any more because you're worried about your own safety, I understand, so just let me know. <laughs> There's also plenty of salt. That's a good question. So, it, the best the best answer is trial and error. So, I went through a, a couple different phases of trying out different vacuum chambers. Uh, initially, just with glass, regular glass, like a I think it was a paper's jar from Trader Joe's, and that cracked. Fortunately, none of these resulted in you know implosions, but it cracked. So I knew that wasn't good. Um, additionally, I did research into this, so it wasn't just a, you know swinging for the fences. Um, and, and then I went to borosilicate glass, which is an even stronger type of glass, but I made a mistake there because borosilicate has a high tensile strength, but not, it can't really withstand temperature swings very well. So that's when I realized that I need quartz, that it was all about temperature, not strength, really. Yeah. Time for one more question. I'll ask you, what are your two lines for? What are your future plans? So, I'll be getting my master's degree in material science and engineering um, at Columbia University uh, next fall, where I aim to advance this graphene research. 